Welcome. My name is Dan Bannick, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar today. Uh, this webinar is being organized by the Center for Development and the Environment at the University of Oslo, where there are two particular projects and initiatives that are co-organizing and co-hosting it. One is the Oslo SDG initiative that I direct, and another is the INDEF research project, which looks at India's footprint in Africa and the politics of uh, gifts and reciprocity, where we also look at South-South cooperation. So it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to this webinar. And we have a fantastic panel that will be discussing many interesting issues, many highly relevant issues. I'm a professor of political science and I direct the Oslo SDG Initiative, but also this in-depth research project in close collaboration with my colleague, Professor Renu Modi at the University of Mumbai, who's also in the panel today. Before I introduce our main speaker, Professor Vincent Duclos, Duclo, let me highlight a couple of issues that I feel are particularly relevant. You know, there's been quite a lot of attention these days on, on um, how China is perhaps uh, strengthening its position in Africa. There's considerable attention on China and Africa, of course. There's a lot of focus on UK-Africa relationships and major summits that are being held. Later this month, there will be a France-Africa initiative Russia has been showing a lot of interest. What about India? In many ways, I feel that the India-Africa relationship has not received the kind of attention it deserves, which is a bit surprising. And the, the works, the kind of academic interest in India-Africa has typically tended to focus on bilateral aid and investments and Bollywood and yoga. But there's this one particular initiative that India launched slightly a decade ago called the Pan-African E-Network or PAN or P-A-E-N, the acronym, which really is very, very interesting in this current day and age. It is about somehow using this kind of muscle that India has in ICT and health services and to provide using that kind of technology to provide tele-education and telemedicine services in Africa, connecting universities in India, hospitals in India with African counterparts. And this has been in operation for over a decade. And today we're going to focus mainly on the telemedicine uh, component. For some of you, it may be a bit strange that we're talking about this when India is going through a huge catastrophe, a pandemic. But I think it is particularly relevant in India, but also in many other parts of the world, this telemedicine components. So I, I hope that you find that this, this webinar to be of, of special interest today. So without further ado, let me introduce the main speaker. Professor Vincent Duclos is a medical anthropologist. And if there's anybody who's done any work on this, it is him. It is the PAEN in many ways, he's the master, the doyen of, of all scholars who's been working on this. And in addition to, of course, India-Africa relations, Vincent is interested in digital technology, global health, all of these issues that are extremely important in this day and age as we all face the pandemic. So Vincent, welcome. And we are also joined by my colleague, uh, Professor Renu Modi, who is not just a professor, but also the director of the Center for African Studies at the University of Mumbai, and somebody who I collaborate with closely. She will be offering comments and we'll be engaging in a discussion, the three of us, together with any Q&A that you may have. So you're welcome to come with comments and suggestions and questions in the Q&A box. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Vincent Duclos. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a honor. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'll go straight. I'll go straight into the talk because I don't want to waste any time. I will share my screen with you um, so that you can see because I've prepared some slides um, for today's talk. Um, I'll start with this quote. Um, so we're a nation of a billion people, and our thought is. What can I give to the world? We can give knowledge. We can remove the pain of the people. That is a type of culture we have. Um, so, uh, so this is what explained the late Dr. Abdul Kalam when we met in New Delhi. 
uh, almost 10 years ago to this day. Um, the former president, um, uh, who was president when the Pan-African Network was, was announced, uh, re then recalled how the project all began. Uh, he explained to me that it started uh, with his visit to South Africa in 2004, when he was there to attend the session of the Pan-African Parliament. And in his address to the parliament, he engaged the audience with, with what he called a vision. Um, he said, then the idea came in, how to connect them, her hospitals and the African hospitals, her universities and the African university students. How can we connect them? And when I presented, everybody cheered. So the president was already convinced that you know, he, he was uh, having a, an important idea. But only five years later, in 2009, the Pan-African E-Network was launched. I'll refer to it only as Pan. It's only out of laziness because Pan-African E-Network is quite long to, to keep repeating. Uh, so I usually just refer to it as Pan, um, just for the sake of, of simplicity. Um, so yeah, PAN is connecting network, uh, is, a, is a huge network infrastructure connecting doctors and patients, universities and students across the African continent and India. Uh, my own research has focused mainly, uh, as, as Dan mentioned, on the telemedicine dimension of the network. Um, I've, I did visit a few universities, but I ended up really focusing on, it, on the telemedicine dimension of the network, which provides both medical education and treatment, uh, and medical treatment. I carried the bulk of this research um, in 2010, 2011, 2012, although I've, I have to say I really kept you know, uh, in, in touch with the network, especially with African counterparts. Uh, over the last decade. So basically uh, between 2010 and, and 2020, more or less. Uh, my main ethnographic research has been uh, to, 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 to conduct interviews uh, as it should, as well as to uh, conduct field observations within hospitals and also within technical sites. For instance, uh, hubs uh, where data is being kept and being uh, communicated. Uh, so yeah, and yeah, within hospitals, it, this whole project for me, uh, ethnographically speaking, started within hospitals. Uh, so today I will first describe some of the historical developments that have uh, led to the launch of PAN. How was that project even thinkable, imaginable in the first place? Uh, secondly, I will describe uh, too briefly, but I will have to keep it brief, describe PAN's infrastructure, paying particular attention to its spectacular dimensions as a gift. <laughs> uh, and thirdly, uh, I will try to examine some of the medical implications uh, of the project, some of the how it's crafting new medical spaces. Um, so I'm, let me start straight ahead with the histories. Uh, it's a, obviously a simplified version. This, these histories are much more complicated than that but I only have a few minutes to dedicate them, so it has to be a little brief. Um, PAN, as you could see uh, earlier, is branded as a shining example of South-South cooperation. That is, is its slogan. Um, but as a technological project, it is not only looking towards the future, it was also built on top of the past. Um, Pan draws attention to too often neglected genealogies of trade and development and trade and cooperation, in, invoking the memory of earlier forms of South-South cooperation. Um, past India-Africa relations have often become the object of almost mythical narratives, which, revolves, uh, which revolved around events such as the Bandung Conference, and historical figures such as Jawaharlal Nehru, which you see here uh, on the left. So South-South cooperation in classical Nehruvian terms would help contesting economic and techno-scientific monopoly 
uh, of the West, Western economic and techno-scientific monopoly by cultivating a sense of solidarity uh, among South, uh, Southern nations. It, it's traditionally been seen as part of a larger attempt at challenging the colonial and post-colonial world order. Um, while it invokes their memory, the Pan-African E-Network also radically departs from these earlier forms of South-South cooperation, including between India and Africa. So it has, for instance, little in common with the Nehruvian mix of state socialism and technological humanism, uh, which has inspired the Indian model of cooperation until not so long ago, until the turn of the millennium, more or less, uh, including in schemes, for instance, such as the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Scheme, or ITEC. Uh, so historically, India-Africa cooperation has emph emphasized national sovereignty, collective freedom, and socialist development. That's the Nehruvian model, if we may call it this way. The Pan-African E-Network, by contrast, aims at intensified trade in a networked South. Um, in the words of Manmohan Singh, uh, who was the Prime Minister of India when the Pan-African E-Network was launched, self-reliance means trade, not aid. These are the words of Manmohan Singh. Interestingly, actors um, involved in the Pan-African E-Network I found that they have, and it was fascinating to me to discover that, that they have very little time for the language of aid and assistance, which prevails in Western-centric global health worlds. Um, they rather compare the project to Chinese presence and investment in Africa. Um, as the narrative goes, and I've heard this narrative in many different ways, uh, in shapes and forms, China would stand at, as some kind of self-interested self resource extraction operation or, or uh, modus operandi uh, with rather basic infrastructure projects. Uh, that's a narrative. I'm not saying it is actually the case, but that's a narrative. By contrast, in mobilizing the South as a category, uh, the Pan-African E-Network suggests um, aims to set the example of a more moral and cooperative form of capitalism or form of global health uh, between India and Africa. So it promotes the expansion of, on the one hand, Indian hospitals, corporate hospitals, I'll come back to that in a minute, corporate hospitals as a part of a win-win scenario, while hospitals can reach a new patient base uh, on, on the one hand, while patients get access to affordable treatment on the other hand. As, um, as a man manager of uh, Narayana Health Hospital in Bangalore explained to me his motivation in joining the network, we are building a presence. This is what growth is all about. So the Pan-African E-Network, I came to think, stands as a shining example of South-South cooperation to the extent that such a cooperation has become gradually historically conceived as being in itself a form of more a moral form of market expansion. A market expansion which is in itself framed as a modality of care and cooperation. Um, basically uh, of care and cooperation in the name of the South and indeed in the name of humanity. So my work has been basically to to examine the force, the effective and materializing force of this idea, of this con conception uh, uh, of what can a unique contribution to global health and to South-South cooperation uh, look like. But there is a second history which has to be told to better understand where is that project coming from. The second history, uh, one has to know that having worked for the Indian Space Research Organization, which you see here, its logo, its logo, for many years, for something like 20 years, President Kalam did not have to look too far to imagine what a uniquely Indian contribution to the world could look like. 
Kalam was well aware, for instance, of the rapid expansion of telemedicine in India over the previous decade. And the same is true for teleeducation, although I don't know this history as well. Um, so ISRO, ISRO had been using satellite technology to lay out a network connecting all corners of India. And that was already you know, expanding very rapidly in 2004 when Kalam announced uh, the, Pan -African, the idea of the Pan-African e-network. And at the moment of, the, of PAN's launch in 2009, hundreds of medical centers were part of this huge satellite network uh, for which the, the Indian Space Research Organization was providing satellite connectivity. Uh, but what it's important to understand that what was being extended in all corners of India in these years was not only a physical network, it was also a model for the large scale provision of medical care. Uh, the model is relatively simple at the risk of oversimplifying it maybe. Uh, while ISRO expands the network and provides for free the network satellite infrastructure, corporate hospitals, mostly located in the metros in the big cities of the country, provide free medical teleconsultations. For rapidly growing hospital chains, such as Apollo hospitals, telemedicine can, see, can be seen as a tool to build a presence in semi-urban, rural, and remote areas, thus gaining access to new doctors, to new patients, and to new places. By means of telemedicine, we will virtually integrate the medical facility of our country. These are the words of Dr. Pratam Reddy uh, in 2001. So when really when it all started to, to, uh, to grow up rapidly, this, this telemed telemedicine network in India. So the deployment of telemedicine in India, it should be said also, concurs with a disinvestment in the public health infrastructures in India, particularly in remote and rural areas, not in urban areas, but particularly in remote and rural areas. Uh, so the spread of telemedicine in India uh, produces, one, one could argue, and it's not unique to India, telemedicine does that in many different places, but it's unique to India that this network grew so early, grew so early, right, um, 20 years ago. Uh, so telemedicine produces remote patient populations, which are basically disentangled from the state as a care provider. What is at stake is a public-private partnership, a PPP, basically, a model of care in which the state acts as a facilitator but not the provider of medical care. So for instance, providing the network infrastructure free of cost, but not the care itself, which is being provided by uh, tertiary, private tertiary hospitals located in the, in the country's metro. So it's important that on the one hand, it follows, I, I could not go through that very long history with you today, but it, there's a long history of, of the development of satellite technology in India which should come with a social mission, with the notion of you know, uh, benefiting the masses, benefiting the, the people of, of India, not only uh, uh, going for, uh, for, for uh, moonshots, et cetera, going for you know, basic, serving basic needs, fulfilling basic needs. And on the, on the other hand, this mission has taken a turn in the, uh, after uh, the economic reforms, whereas it really start to, started to help uh, the private sector in India providing and reaching for regions where they were not already as present in the country. So it's both an infrastructure and a model which keeps evolving. Uh, now we'll say a word about the infrastructure of the Pan-African E-Network itself. Uh, one should note that PAN is an excessively ambitious project. <laughs> it's a very ambitious project, which is what I've always liked about it. Uh, implemented by uh, TCIL, which, which stands for Telecommunications India Limited. It's a public Indian company already very, very active in Africa. Um, it's, a, it's a major investment entirely founded by the Indian government, almost entirely funded. I mean basically entirely, on paper entirely founded by the Indian government. 
uh, implementing PAN as involve extending a transnational network infrastructure, fiber optic network connecting uh, hospitals in India. This infrastructure was already present, but it had to be leased. Uh, undersea cables to, to, to go from India to Africa. Once again, this was leased. Uh, and uh, satellite connectivity to connect its African sites. Uh, you can see the footprint of the Rascam satellite uh, in the bottom picture. So this is uh, the Rascam satellite is uh, Rascam star uh, QAF satellite is, is the first, uh, it, it belongs, it was launched by the African Union many years ago and is the first uh, communication satellite co with a footprint co covering the old continent. So this, it is being leased uh, by the Pan-African E-Network to connect all of the African sites. Um, so the telemedicine network connects 12 tertiary care hospitals in India, mostly private hospitals. I believe nine or 10 out of them are private um, with over 30 hospitals located in as many African countries. These numbers tend to change, right? It could be 40 today, but it, I, well, not today. It could have been 40 when it basically stopped. I'll come to that later. But, you know, it changed over 10 years. When I did the bulk of my research, more or less 30 hospitals were actively connected. Um, but beyond the tech, its technical features, PAN also exists as, as a site of effective and imaginative investment, if we may call it this way. Uh, you have to think big. Dr. Kalam, he thinks big. It was his vision. The Pan-African E-Network is the mother of all telemedicine projects. These are the words of the chairman of TCIL when we met again in New Delhi. The network he suggested would inevitably multiply it's the mother of all telemedicine project. So PAN can be seen as a kind of a incubator <laughs> for future relations, for unlimited and undefined growth. So value, I, I argue that value in PAN is driven by a, that kind of speculation in the future. Uh, rather than, I, I cannot really speak about that today, maybe some other time, but rather than the, than by the kind of experimentation that we see in global health usually, which would involve clinical trials, you know, random, random miles, uh, trials, et cetera, et cetera. There's none of that in PAN. So it's more about speculating about on the future than about, you know, small scale experimentations that would grow really, really gradually. Um, PAN generates futures by putting together what anthropologist Anat Singh refers to as a dramatic performance. From its very beginnings, it has benefited from significant public exposure. Uh, for, po for politicians and entrepreneurs, the network is the stage for diplomatic touring and many photo opportunities. Um, PAN has, was awarded international prizes, a few of them, uh, corporate films, I, I know of three of them at least, <laughs> were released about it. Uh, gleaming, all of them gleaming with images of uh, modern technology and promises of economic miracles. Um, there's also a lot of brochures, you know, the typical stuff for these projects, brochures, flyers, political speeches, official declarations or statements, etc. Another key feature of, of Penn's dramatization uh, of the future, if we may say, lies uh, is to be found in Dr. Kalam himself, his charismatic energy. Uh, researching Penn, I rapidly came to realize that the attachment to the project was inseparable from an attachment to Kalam himself. Um, the invocation of his name uh, was always intimately tied with the invocation of India as some kind of a brand in, an, in a nation uh, with a, which instills a spirit of future possibility. Kalam is known as a, as a dreamer, a dream maker. Uh, and he's been very, very prolific uh, in India, at least in the years I was there. Um, but as is often the case throughout India's history, aspirations for the future uh, are also grounded in imaginations and narratives of the past, in, in, in histories of the past. 
So Kalam's vision is one in which the nature kind of rediscovers itself as a strong and sovereign land of knowledge. He's written a lot about that, uh, including when he's speaking about the Pan-African network itself. Uh, so Kalam imagined Pan as kind of a medium through which the nation projects itself in the future, at long last occupying its rightful place on this planet. And these are his words, uh, actually. And I'll move on too rapidly, obviously, uh, to, to the medical implications uh, of the project. Pan delivers two kinds of medical services. On the one, there are, on the one hand, medical teleconsultations, and on the other hand, continuing medical education. Uh, put simply, very, very simply, the network aims at caring for patients and providing medical training at a distance or remotely. Um, teleconsultations cover a dozen medical specialties, radiology, neurology, and pediatric care were among the most common when I did this research. Teleconsultations were provided free of charge. They took place in studios equipped for this purpose with communication and medical equipment. So these are studios that were set up in every participating hospital, uh, it, it, whether, whether it be in India or in Africa. Um, so the consultations consist basically of video conference sessions between Indian specialists and their African colleagues, sometimes involving patients, but not always, and, and not that often, actually. Uh, so the, the colleagues, the Indian uh, specialists and their African colleagues would discuss patient cases, clinical impressions, probable diagnoses, and advisable treatments, more or less. These are the things that would be discussed. Uh, usually the teleconsultation will be requested by medical teams in Africa and in, in, in connected participating uh, African hospitals to address challenging patient cases. Uh, they may also be used to obtain a second opinion when a diagnosis is uncertain. Uh, they may also provide support in the therapeutic management of certain patients and in assisting doctors who are inexperienced with performing certain procedures. I've witnessed that myself. I've done most of this research uh, the clinical side of the research myself in, in Senegal, in, in Dakar, at uh, Fan Hospital, which, which is uh, located in Dakar. And as you can see here, here's a quote from a, from a doctor in, in Dakar. Uh, it's my own translation because that part of the research I've conducted in, in French. Uh, the network broadens our vision. It opens it up to all sorts of possibilities in terms of diagnosis and therapy. At first glance, and this is very interesting, and I have to say right away that this network was most welcome at Fan Hospital. You know, uh, doctors uh, li like to use it. Uh, it was not used that much, but still they, they spoke about it in, in very positive terms. At first glance, uh, this might appear to confirm what one of the main expectations associated with telemedicine, namely to provide access to medical information and care, regardless of physical distance and location. Uh, my research, however, challenges such a vision a little bit as well. For example, participating doctors often had to adapt courses of treatment um, according to the local availability of diagnostic testing or medicines. Uh, failing connectivity, and it happened a lot, <laughs> may, can, may come with huge health consequences. And patients uh, remotely diagnosed may need to travel to have proper access to treatment. It is one thing to know that you have a certain condition and is totally a different thing to really have access to proper treatment locally. Uh, and the travel was not subsidized or was not paid for by the Pan-African e-network, leading situa to situations sometimes when patients would learn that they have cancer or something else, but not, could not really have access to treatment locally. 
Um, so uh, while Pan is supposed to be particularly adapted to local conditions, that is the old narrative of South South, saying you know we we basically share a common history. We know where you're coming from. We're capable of you know. Uh, the, it's actually not always the case. A private tertiary hospital in New Delhi or in Chennai has little in common with a public hospital in a small town in Somalia, for instance. Uh, I, I, so there is always a constant work of mediation and adaptation or improvisation that takes place in order for care to actually happen. <laughs> uh, so sometimes, uh, so, so sometimes care is possible, sometimes it's not. At times expertise circulates uh, without treatment per se, as I just mentioned. Uh, knowledge circulates, but it is often not sufficient to facilitate access to care. Uh, so the possible, what I'm trying to say here is that the possibilities of care uh, and to care for patients remain grounded in local conditions, which are economic, material, and infrastructural. And sometimes this became frustrating for, for doctors in Africa. Here's a quote from a neurologist in Dakar. Sometimes we, already, uh, we have already thought about the things they are asking us to do. However, we can't. We do not have the means. We have to improvise. It becomes very frustrating. He was referring, for instance, to an Indian doctor saying, well, you need to do this MRI. <laughs> you need to do that before the surgery or something like that. And Dr. Basong would be, well, we don't have one or the patient is not capable of paying for it or something like that. So th this became uh, very frustrating of always being reminded that he's not basically following uh, evidence-based protocols, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and being reminded that he's not practicing the way he would like to be practicing in the first place, uh, taking care of patients in the first place. So this creates some kind of tension sometimes. And, and what one has to keep in mind that there is always kind of a, a gap or a friction between uh, uh, the ideal of telemedicine and the actual practice in everyday clinical settings. So this is kind of a summary. Uh, uh, a, I, I'm saying basically that the Pan-African e-network at times produce something like medical enclosures or enclaves. Uh, this is a twofold argument. On the one hand, uh, in order to be effective, in order to work properly at a technologic, technological level, PAN had sort of to insulate itself from the sites where it operates. I mentioned studios before. So you would walk in a hospital. I visited three hospitals in Africa, and the studios would be brand new with AC and totally isolated from the rest of the hospital. So there was some kind of a physical isolation where you could see that this was something uh, in which there was much more investment than in the other wing of the hospital uh, nearby. Uh, so there was some kind of physical isolation. The, the network was not integrated in, in the departments or in the care units. It was a, a remote physical location, both in India and in Africa. It's not unique to PAN. It's very often the case with telemedicine, but, any, but in any case, there is, there is a physical isolation and it came with its own technical kit, if we may say, for instance, with engineers. <laughs> That's a good example. With engineers very often traveling, most of them traveling from India. So you would have one or two engineers or technicians, whatever you want, we'll call, call them, traveling from India uh, uh, as part of the network. So most of them were, would not be African uh, engineers. They would be Indian engineers traveling to Africa. So it, So there was always some kind of a distance that, that was sort of necessary to keep the network running in a standardized form because it was so big and so large and, and, and it came as a uh, as a turnkey solution as a uh, as a one-size-fits-all approach uh a, to network implementation which meant that instead of growing organically from local sites it was kind of a vertically uh a, a imposed if we may say uh and, and that means that it had to be sort of isolated. It could not adapt to local conditions, which you would have to adapt to 30 or 35 or 40 different settings. Uh, so instead, uh, a turnkey solution was proposed, but it also means that medically speaking, it was always sort of distant 
from the main concerns in the everyday conditions of practice in the hospitals where it's located. So that's the first kind of insulation, if we may say, in which connected hospitals are kind of confused with indistinct inter interchangeable sites. Uh, and that's not unique to Penn. Telemedicine very often, especially in these years, uh, operated in, in this way, but Penn, what's unique to Penn is the is the size, <laughs> is the scale of the network, which right from the very beginning was was very large. And secondly, uh, a second form of of enclaving or enclosure has to do with the circulation of knowledge, images, and patients. Uh, uh, some places get connected, others don't. Some people get treated, others don't. So on the one hand, it does provide some kind of uh, limited access to healthcare to, to some patients. On the other hand, it can also reinforce exist, pre-existing inequalities in terms of access to healthcare. I'm not saying that these enclaves or enclosures are airtight containers, but definitely that can modulate access to and mobility. Uh, sometimes it will uh, challenge pre-existing uh, trajectories of patients instead of going to France, they would come to India or something like that. But on other occasions, it would also reify distinctions among peoples and places. I'll just move to a, con a quick conclusion. Um, well, clearly, if we speak to, to what's going on in these days, uh, Clearly, and I'll give that to Penn without a doubt, it does not carry and it does not pretend, the project does not carry and it does not pretend to carry the kind of redemptive hopes found in early forms of South-South or India Africa solidarity. Again, as I mentioned, Penn does not speak the language of aid or of humanitarian assistance. Uh, its actors are not interested, and I've heard over and over again, you know, we've heard, we've had enough of that, enough of that in India ourselves, of this language, so we're not going to reproduce that model, and that was welcome for African partners, in, in, my, in my understanding. Um, so, can the, Pan does not, can with, does not come with this kind of redemptive uh, hopes. Uh, neither can it be associated with more recent calls to decolonize global health. Uh, it does not challenge the neoliberal economics that have been guiding the development of global health over the past few decades. Uh, can, Pan could even be seen, if we may say, as an, as an illustration of what Vijay Prashad, Prashad refers to as, this, as the South from above. Uh, it, it could be seen this way. On the other hand, which is more positive, Penn destabilizes assumptions dominant in global health spheres about the circulation of knowledge, technology, and care along north-south lines. It really, as, as Professor Benick mentioned, it destabilizes these narratives of north-south circulation. It does not deploy the south in relation to the Western to Western assumptions or priorities. And that's very interesting. It comes with its own assumptions and priorities. India has often been referred to as the pharmacy of the developing world. But the, and we see that obviously these days uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. But the practices and effects of India's globalizing hospital sector have been much less examined. Uh, they have been, including by Renu Modi, but they've not been extensively ethnographically examined. This includes the outsourcing of medical services, the growing number of African patients traveling to India to receive medical care, and the spread of Indian private hospitals across the African continent. All of these practices are actively pursued in the Pan-African e-network. So it's important, I would end by saying that it's important to take seriously the kind of economic and political logics of dream making, which is at stake in a project like the, like the Pan-African e-network. What kind of futures is it hinting at? How does a large network of medical enclosures or sites in Africa 
contribute in our imagination of India and in our imagination of what can in India contribution to global health look like? Um, thank you. Thank you, Vincent. That's That was a fascinating overview and you've identified several issues that I hope we can return to in the discussion. But let me first invite Professor Renu Modi to offer some initial comments and then we'll also include some of the Q&A if there are any uh, later on. So Renu. Thank you, Professor Vincent for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. We have read your work and it was fantastic listening to you. So while I was listening to you, I made a few points which I will share with our viewers today. So first, why is the Pan-Africa e-network even relevant today, despite all its challenges? First, at the aspirational level, it aligns with the sustainable development goals of education and health with SDG 2063 of the Africa that we want, basically, and that is what Africa wants. So that is still a vision that India and Africa would share if the Pan-Africa e-network was revived. Second, what is the USP of the Pan-Africa e-network? The USP of the Pan-Africa e-network clearly is the trinity of trade, technology transfer, and training. And training is at the fulcrum of India's development cooperation, which is at capacity building. Now, Professor Vincent, something which uh, I was uh, would like to share is that and we need to think about is what are the challenges that Pan-Africa e-network faced? Why was it not a success? Despite it being such an ambitious project, it is still, I understand it's a photo op, et cetera. Now I was thinking to myself and I have interviewed so many ambassadors and I tried to broach the topic. The response has always been tepid. Either they sidestep the issue or they have, they do not give very definitive answers. So the challenges I would think is a lack of ownership uh, in the African partners themselves. At the India Africa Forum Summit of 2015, there was a review of all the projects that India had invested in. And the problem that has plagued the other projects has, I think, also plagued this Pan-Africa e-network. And that brings me to the question of what is the future of aid in the global health scenario in Africa? You know, so can Africa expect a free aid like Pan-Africa e-network purported to be, it was a 500 crore project, a 125 million project. Suddenly in 2017, it has been closed in a way. It has been revived in a short way. I was looking through the literature. So now it has been handed over to the Africa Union, then to Senegal to take care of it. And what has been written on the website is that Africa Union and all the countries have to sit together and work out a sustainable model of carrying this project further, which means that they have to contribute to the, it may be subsidized for the patients, but every country needs to contribute. So this whole discourse of aid in global health clearly is a disappearing factor. And what would we see the future of this project? So if Pan-Africa e-networks to be redesigned, would we have this one-time grant or would we kind of phase it out for the handholding? which has been the case with many of the grants that Africa has received on project. And talking of the private sector Apollo, what did Apollo gain in the as an outcome? I don't think Apollo made any inroads into Africa with this project. In Tanzania in 2010, when I had gone, there were negotiations on for some Apollo hospital to be set up in the outskirts of Dar es Salaam. It has been 2020 and now 2021. The land for that project has not been identified and there was a difference of opinion. So the allocation of land for another hospital, Medanta, I heard Mr. Naresh Trihan himself. So the African countries I feel are themselves responsible partly for the poor performance of this project. And of course, what you say that we are dealing with two unequal worlds of infrastructure. They do not have an MRI machine, Somalia and countries like that. They would not have a, a CAT scanner and all that. So how are you going to deal with this project? And of course, infrastructure and ownership is where any aid project is going to succeed in future. And the second thing I want to talk about is the uh, post uh, COVID scenario. So it, what did the project, uh, what did the project 
uh, provide India in terms of a private um, sector uh, gains. Medical tourism, as you rightly said, when patients did not have the required uh, wherewithal and infrastructure in Africa, many of the African patients came to India for treatment. Apollo was one of the leading um, a pay, a hospital where many international patients came. They tied up with Emirates, with Kenyan Airways, they offered packages and patients came. But in the post-COVID scenario, medical tourism, I do not see it reviving at least for the next two, three years. Second, India, the pharmacy of the world, we are through a severe health crisis where we cannot even take care of ourselves. I mean, there is aid flowing in every day. It is such a dismal, scary scenario. Delhi at the epicenter, all of India struggling for oxygen for and oxygen concentrators largely being mustered up by the Indian diaspora. So that I think will dent India's image as a healthcare provider. So I do not see it showing up in the immediate future. So in these given scenarios, we can definitely question that how will we frame our medical cooperation in health? It will not be aid given the, the scenario that we have, the financial crunch that any country is going to have post COVID. So for the African healthcare sector, uh, the project did show the power of globalization, the place of Africa within it, and the desire of India and to, to make Africa an integral part of it. But in the post-COVID scenario, all these assumptions are going to be challenged. And we need to see where will be the future of global health aid in Africa with India or any other country. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Renu. Vincent, the, let's, let's um, tackle one set of issues. And this is something that Renu raised, this ownership aspect. So we'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Is it the lack of ownership, the lack of interest from African participating countries to fund this? Is that one of the reasons for its relative lack of success? That's one set of issues. But there's also another side of the coin has there been less ownership also from the Indian side? So you were saying it was all about President Kalam. So as long as he was around, maybe there was more interest, more vigor. But once he sort of left the scene, maybe things changed. So could you address that ownership issue, both from the African recipient country perspective, as well as also from the Indian perspective, as you see it now? Yeah, thank you both for your great questions. That it's a lot of ground to cover, but I'll do my best. Uh, let's start with this question of ownership. It's, it should be clarified that I've been doing most of my, my field work within the project's care settings, right? Within hospitals and within technical, technical hubs, whether it be in New Delhi or, uh, or in Dakar. Uh, I've not interviewed as many ambassadors as, as you might have Renew, so I, I cannot speak a lot about you know the political ownership of the project. What I can say is on the ground within hospitals and within uh, in within uh, technolo technological hubs and, and locations, uh, the lack of ownership was largely, as far as in my own analysis, uh, related to the design of the project itself. You know, to the fact that it was not designed in a way that was catered to local needs, uh, whether in, into uh, local situations, they, they might be linguistic. Uh, some of it had to do with the with the, the schedule, uh, with the uh, medical rounds, the schedule of the uh, of, of given hospitals. Some had to do with uh, again uh, the infrastructure of a certain hospital, et cetera. But that's not unique to PAN. You know, uh, I've done a lot of research about other digital health projects in, in Africa. And, and what you find is if you want ownership, you, you can usually would have to start with a much smaller scale. And you would have to start, you know, involve people from the very beginning in the design stage and involve, involve uh, local actors uh, and basically start from the ground up in terms of your approach. The Pan-African E-Networks is total opposite of that. So on the one hand, you could say that yes, political ownership was not there, 
uh, politically speaking, on the other hand, just for instance, of not hiring African engineers and of hiring Indian engineers, and it comes with linguistic uh, language barriers, it comes with uh, 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 all kinds of cultural and social uh, potential issues uh, in, in terms of integrating a project in a hospital, for instance. So from, I think it's it, it kind of what was kind of, uh, uh, it, almost inevitable for such a large scale project, this, this problem of ownership. It's very, very hard to implement a project in 35 different countries with very different uh, heterogeneous conditions uh, and to uh, expect that it will work and be owned locally, but it was imposed from the top down. You know, ambassadors and diplomats told medical practitioners, you're gonna use that project. <laughs> Basically, it never came from the bottom up as a, as a reflection of local needs. Uh, and, and so that's been a problem uh, as far as I'm concerned. And, and it has to do with the scale of the project. And now the project about this financial future and about you know, right from the beginning, this project in, in the way it's never been advertised this way, but in, in my many interviews, I've always understood that the project always was always aimed at becoming a private entity in the long run. So it started as a gift, but ultimately after five years, it was supposed to be transferred to the African Union and, 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 and be sustainable, not needing Indian money anymore after five years and gradually involved into some, I was given the example of the RASCOM satellite, which, which was funded by the African Union and then became a corporate entity and now is kind of self-sustaining. So the project was always designed as a way to ultimately become some kind of a private network in which uh, um, African hospitals or partners would have to pay to use the services that were initially provided for free. That's my understanding. Coming from interviews at the African Union in, in India, of how this network was designed in the first place. So what we see today, this new model is basically what was supposed to happen in 2014 or 20. Now today it's also come with a new uh, name. Uh, uh, it, it's come with, uh, it's a little paradoxical for me that now that the African Union would be in charge of the project, it, come with, it comes with a Sanskrit name that a lot of the African partners are struggling to pronounce. Uh, and, and so I, I, So it's come, so I'm not sure that this gap is, I think this gap might even be a widening between the offer and the actual uh, local conditions, but I'm not certain because I've not, I've not been doing field work on this new version of the project. So all of this is based on informal discussions with old folks <laughs> that I've got to know over years. Uh, what did Apollo gain? It gained branding. That's basically it. You know, it gained uh, it, how many flyers of Apollo mentioned the Pan African e network. It, it gained pride. It gained this notion of being present. It gained this notion of being capable of saying, you know, we have uh, this net, we're providing healthcare to patients in over 30 African countries or 52, as they would say, African countries. It gained, uh, it gained something which is not necessarily. Uh, it's not necessarily money uh, right right away. It's not short-term financial gain. Will it translate in long-term financial gain? As you mentioned, I'm not sure. It's And it's never been certain anyway. It's never been certain exactly how it would translate financially in the long run. In 2010, 2011, 2012, there were much more talks of opening hospitals here and there. When I was in Dakar, African representatives from hospitals in India would travel to Dakar to come and meet and the Pan-African e-network was basically the, the card that you would, you know, it was, was the thing that opened this possibility of having a, so, so, so it gained, a, yeah, it opened up opportunities. It's not certain that they have been used fully, fully and I'm not sure that they will, certainly not in, the ter in terms of medical tourism. Some patients traveled to India as part of the Pan-African e-network and that it ended up being treated in Chennai or in New Delhi or in Mumbai. Uh, not so many, and it's very hard to know how many. <laughs> um, I'm going to just say that uh, because you hear very varying uh, variable numbers. 
Uh, so it's hard to know exactly, is it, you know, 150 or 5,000, you know? Uh, so it's hard to know how, or, or 50. It, it's, it's a very, very, very wide spectrum of, uh, in terms of numbers that I've heard, whether you speak with technicians or engineers on the ground, or whether you speak with politicians or whether you're, you're gonna have very different numbers. And I'm not a detective and I'm not really interested in knowing the exact numbers, right? Uh, so, but some patients travel, but definitely probably not enough for the money's worth of the investment of the Pan-African e-network in the first place. Now I'm gonna finish with this question of, of post-COVID and COVID. I mean, I have to say that, you know, when, when I've seen the prime minister of India with all due respect, but sending vaccines and making a huge statement about it to Canada, while we already had ordered five times the, the vaccines we needed uh, in, in Canada, we're totally, uh, yeah, uh, a, a few months ago and making a huge political statement around it. I think it was in March or, or February. And it reminded me of the Pan-African network a little bit. This notion of, you know, we're capable, we have enough facilities, we're capable of exporting vaccines even to the richest nations of the world, including Canada, et cetera, et cetera. We have that kind you know, without having vaccinated its own population first. Uh, so this kind of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, vaccine diplomacy, it's now being called, uh, it reminded me a little bit because I had heard these discourses a lot doing interviews at the time of the Pan-African e-network. When people in India especially would tell me, how can we export all of that without taking care of our own population first? How can we provide this elite tertiary care to, uh, to, to, to rich people in Africa, et cetera, et cetera, while we don't even take care of our poor? So this kind of dual dichotomy between, you know, we're capable of making a big show out of exporting healthcare without first making sure that everybody here has access to healthcare. I've heard it a lot. Uh, I think it's a little simplistic in terms of analysis, but I've heard that narrative a lot. And, and obviously you hear it these days, whereas, you know, you know, the prime minister has decided to export vaccines to Canada that not really needed it, just wanted to be faster, but all of our vaccines were already pre-ordered Anyway, uh, in, 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 so you understand what I mean? This kind of, you know, uh, in, in you hear it these days, obviously all of my colleagues and friends in India are like, we should not have done that. And we should have made sure first that everybody here has access to, 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 to vaccines and to treatment. So Vincent, I think, yeah, and it, it, yeah. we're running out of time. So yeah. I want to also um, get um, Renu into the conversation, but it seems to me that two sets of issues and I'd like both of you to reflect on them. One has to do with, this reputation that India is the pharmacy of the world, not just the developing world, there's been this idea that, you know, it is important also for the US. And I wonder to what extent, at least my gut feeling is that the Pan-African e-network was an important tool to, to varying degrees that yeah. contributed to this enhanced reputation that India is an actor. So it's not just producing medicines, but also imparting knowledge. So to what extent you think that has been important? And related to that is the second aspect that I'm wondering about, Vincent, as you spoke and you talked about, and I've been looking at pictures of the infrastructure, you talked about the inequalities that existed before. And I'm wondering from the recipient perspective. Let's talk about African doctors or doctors in African hospitals. When, to what extent do you think there was interest in this knowledge from India? Yeah. Because they are often trained in other parts of the world. They may have been trained in the UK, in the US, they're coming back and they're working there. So, you know, I, I often wonder to what extent they felt compelled. Yeah. Was there a lot of interest to initiate these sessions. And once that knowledge was imparted or those interactions took place, were they considered to be relevant? So that's, that's one set of issues. Then of course, the other has to do with once you know what is to be done, there are no facilities as you highlighted, there may not be an MRI machine. So I'm, you know, I'd like both of you to reflect a bit on this pharmacy of the world reputation that PAN may have contributed to, and this tension between knowledge and demand, respect for Indian knowledge, the kind of uptake to that, and then this frustration 
we know what is to be done, but we don't really have a concrete way of addressing these. So, yeah. so, so maybe Renu, um, you could reflect a bit and then we could give Vincent the, the final word. Uh, please unmute um, yourself. Yeah, yeah, thanks. So from, if we see the data and statistics on teleconsultation for the years 2010 to 2017, it is about 770 consultations per year per annum, which amounts to only two consultations. I mean, how much does it amount to? Just two consultations, maybe it's it's really less, you know, there are not that many consultations per year. Degrees awarded is 22,000 undergrad and postgrad degrees, right? And continuing education for doctors and nurses was, was less than 7,000. So the statistics clearly say that as Vincent rightly points out that there was some problem in the designing of the project. It definitely showcases the transformational power of knowledge of sharing knowledge of a good intention of Kalam, you know, and maybe the Indian uh, exceptionalism of being the Vishwaguru through its pharmacy of the world, even then, which we can now um, align with the new regime. But this has always existed in our foreign policy and development cooperation. So if we did Pan Africa in network differently today, if we did, would the Indian government admit that they did not, they did a top-down approach, which I agree with you totally, Vincent. And how would we design it? Would we go to countries with a hundred percent mobile telephony net penetration, for example, Ghana or not Malawi, South Africa, Nigeria? So would that be the future of tele uh, medicine today with the pan? And if you see the website, they are only advertising the e Vidya Bharti, the education network. There is nothing on the E Arogya Bharti, the medical component. And for 2021, even the admissions for the educational component has been suspended because of COVID. So I think uh, Pan Africa E Network is going to kind of be very tepid in the next two, three years to come. And I'm not sure if it's going to be revived because now the onus is on the African themselves. Though I still agree that there's an idea of showcasing knowledge, sharing knowledge, medical skills. It is a very laudable project, but the problem is in the implementation. Thanks, Renu. Thanks, Renu. Uh, Vincent, could you please uh, sum up and um, as, as quickly as you can, we uh, don't really have uh, very much time. So, um, you know, in a few minutes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that quickly. Uh, I agree with both of you about the question of reputation. I think it's has to be analyzed at a different level as that as the as the question of efficacy, efficacy and what actually you know how many patients have actually been treated versus the reputation is kind of separate realms as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so you can contribute to this reputation of being the pharmacy of the world without treating you know hundreds of thousands of patients, etc. Uh, and, and so so I think I, I agree with you then that it has contributed even though probably obviously it's not. A pharmaceutical approach, you know, it's, uh, it, 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 but it sort of aimed at doing at a hospital level uh, uh, with the Serum Institute, et cetera, has been doing at a pharmaceutical level, if we may say. Uh, it, I mean, the branding is very similar, this notion of, you know, providing cheaper, et cetera, you know, world class at, you know, thrilled world prices, et cetera, et cetera. It's similar, uh, but it's not working as easily. And it's not, it's a very, very different enterprise. Uh, and now this question of African doctors, I just want to uh, finish on that. I have to say first that most doctors that I've spoken with love the project, but also including for reasons because they are used to these colonial and post-colonial ties, ties with France, for instance, in Senegal, whereas, you know, uh, uh, doctors would come and do surgery uh, in the car or patients would be, fly, would be, fly, uh, would be flying to Paris, et cetera, to get treatment. So this question of transferring knowledge instead of transferring patients, and instead of you know a team of surgeons flying in to operate on their patients was something which was seen very positively. Uh, and, and they would like to have new partners instead of relying on, you know, obviously relying on the old colonial folks is not something that they liked very much. So there was, this, this question was there, but nowadays, you know, in, in Fan Hospital in Dakar, they have a new pediatric surgery wing, which has been funded by France, etc. So it's it's complicated, but on, but there was optimism, 
there was a sense of this is new, something could happen with that. But then for design, re design reasons that I've mentioned earlier, it was not easy to use it and it was not uh, always effective. It was sometimes frustrating. So uh, there was kind of mixed feelings. On the one hand, the sense of optimism, on the other hand, the sense of you know, using it is not obvious and, and, and for all kinds of reasons. Uh, and and it, it explains a lot the underutilization, the low utilization, which was very focused in a few countries in a few places. A lot of countries have basically never used it. <laughs> in some places, like the car used it the most, I think. Uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Vincent. I don't think this will be the last time we chat about this. Um, Thank you so much for your talk and uh, thank you, Renu, for your comments. Uh, we look forward to further discussions on this as part of our INDEF project. And Vincent, we can't wait to see your book, your latest book come out on this topic. So thank you all for joining us at this webinar today and uh, be safe wherever you are. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so you Dan. Thank you, Vincent. Hope to see you soon. Yes, it's been a pleasure.